counting down to CNBC TV 18's mega initiative, Future Female Forward, the Women's Collective presented by HSBC, which is set to be launched in just a few moments from now. Shireen Bhan, in fact, uh, joins us now from the red carpet with a very special guest. Over to you, Shireen. Well, we have a very special guest joining us here at our future female forward launch event, a woman who broke the glass ceiling, so to speak, at uh, the Reserve Bank on Mint Street. Ma'am, thanks very much for joining us. What a pleasure it is to see you here. Uh, and I want to understand from you through your own journey, you know, today we're talking about women making entry into different kinds of professions, different kinds of fields, but there is still a long distance to go. The gap continues to be fairly large. When you came uh, into the financial sector onto Min Street. What was that like for you? Uh, well, you're absolutely right. Uh, when I joined, uh, there were not that many women coming in. But uh, I think in the, the finance sector somehow gave opportunities. Maybe it was easier to get in. Uh, you know, we had, like we just got in through competitive exams and you passed that exam and yes, you are posted to different places. Like I was posted out of Bangalore my hometown to Mumbai and it wasn't easy to get the support of the family to say okay you go and live alone in Mumbai you know imagine but yes a lot of parental support but I think one thing a lot depends on the organization and the, the really what kind of opportunities they give and really how they are like uh, gender indifferent I would say I wouldn't even say neutral or pro women and all that so I think women are able to really prosper in such a conducive environment where it doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman so long as you come up through meritocracy. So you never felt uh, discriminated against? You never felt like you had to fight twice as hard as your male colleagues, your male counterparts? Definitely one had to prove oneself. Huh. And uh, certainly women will not be recognized if they, they don't prove themselves. Huh? That's for sure. Because there's no other way we can uh, really aspire other than through our own hard work, merit, and how we are, uh, like, make a difference to the organization. So that's a must. I think for all women, you have to prove yourself. That is definitely the case. You know, I, I want to ask you this, because a lot of uh, women struggle with uh, having to be everything at all times. You know, you told me before we came in here that you're on POHA duty later tonight. So how hard is that just to juggle different roles, balance different roles? Uh, to young mothers today, what would your advice be? I, it's really tough to juggle all the roles. And I think we should not think that we are super women. And uh, get your priorities, get the support of the family. Absolutely, that's a must. You need to ask for support. Don't give up your dreams and ambitions just because you're hesitant to seek support, whether it is your parents or your in-laws, husband, children. And I think that way, my husband, my kids, uh, parents all really, really supported me. But uh, I won't say that I was a superwoman and that I juggled all the roles excellently. I'm sure must have failed somewhere or the other. <laughs> But that's perfectly normal, right? That's perfectly normal, and you, I think that's the way it is, you know. It's, let's not really, uh, you know, think of uh, trying to be extraordinary and say, I'll, I'll achieve everything, you know. I am capable. Maybe one is capable, but we need to have that balance in life and um, understand that there are limits to everything. I get asked this a lot, that if I could go back in time and give myself a piece of advice, in light of all the experiences that I've now had, what would that be? So I'm going to flip that question to you. What would you like to tell yourself maybe 30, 40 years back? 30, 40 years back, maybe I left my children pretty independent. I mean, I, I honestly, unlike current day parents where they get involved with their studies, with all of that. I never got involved. They were doing it on their own. I, I do feel sometimes when I look at how involved parents are that, you know, I, maybe I, I, I should have done more on that front. <laughs>
Well, I, I think that's something that most mothers that I've spoken to, irrespective of what they're doing in life, that is something I think that they all sort of talk about as as being some somewhere, a, a, you know, they call it a guilt, guilt. but so there is some, some there is. yeah, there is that feeling that perhaps they should have uh, been there or done a little bit more. Uh, for women on uh, in, in the financial space, uh, what would your advice be? I, I would, uh, I mean, the advice would be that, uh, <clears throat> you know, like, uh, you know, during the Lehman Brothers, uh, I think it was uh, uh, the IMF MD. So she mentioned that if Lehman Brothers was Lehman Sisters, perhaps this crisis would not have happened. So I do think that women uh, have a great role in finance, particularly because of their maturity, wisdom, judgment, and uh, that's why they are very good in finance. I'm, I know that more have prudent, cases. more prudent, and more prudent, and more prudent, and you know, ability to 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 say no, or you know, ability to have a counter view, uh, and I think that's the the, the virtues I must say of uh, women. Of course, I, one shouldn't generalize yeah. because not all are like that. But yes, it does. I think for women, it's I don't know. Maybe it's easier. <laughs> say no. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. It's always a pleasure. Appreciate you joining us here. And we appreciate you being here for the Future it's Female Forward Launch. Thank launch. you so much, Shireen, for this opportunity. My absolute pleasure, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, guys, uh, we will hand it back to you and come back with more guests here from the Future Female Forward Launch. Well, um, I have with me Suman Gopalan, who is the CHRO at Freshworks. Suman, uh, women in finance, are things getting better? Absolutely. You bet. This is the time to be in corporate India and in startup and in finance. So it is definitely looking up. What would you say is the best advice you ever got when you were starting out that you would like to tell the, you know, the younger women who are starting now? Uh, the best advice that I got is don't listen to what the world has to say. Listen to yourself. Listen to yourself. Since you're looking at the HR, uh, you know, you've been an HR professional for a better part of a quarter of a century. Uh, you know, what are companies you like... You feel very, very old. Yes. You know, what are, you know, because you've been in this field for so long, what I wanted to ask is, what are organizations like Freshworks doing to ensure that there is more uh, diverse participation in the workforce? Yeah, this is something we've done right from the beginning. So it's not something that we decided much later. Uh, we had diverse workforce from the day uh, zero. And uh, this is a part of our DNA. And we've just amplified our efforts as we have grown bigger. And you can see it's paid off very richly for us. And we credit a huge part of who we are as a company and our culture to the kind of workforce we have today, which is very diverse, very different, very passionate, hmm. and that's a big, big thing for us. You know, as a woman leader in your respective space, what is the most bizarre bias you've come across that shouldn't exist in this day and age? <laughs> you have all kinds, you have all kinds, but I think the most common one, which continues to be bizarre for me is, I think people assume that when you take a break, you somehow lose your brains yeah you lose confidence but you don't lose your brains and I think that's a bias that still exists it's a stereotype that still exists we're chipping away at it so I feel hopeful well if you had a penny for every time you were mansplained <laughs> I would be richer than a millionaire today <laughs> all right Sumana thank you thank you so much for your time here and I will uh, toss it back to my co-anchor Manglam Manglam Well, Ritu, I have with me uh, Mr. Venkat of Deloitte. Uh, you know, you usually don't go to any place where there is less than 40% representation of women. Unfortunately, uh, it's a 100% male conversation here. But on a serious note, I mean, all the companies that uh, you consult with and uh, the companies that your own organization, can you give us a strength, rough strength between how many are females and how many are men? In my organization or in others in yours and the others that you interact with uh, well in ours we actually look at it at each level uh, and we also look at it at what happens at the entry level and what we have at the very top and very happy to say that at the entry level we are at about 46 percent but overall as an organization we are at about 41 and uh, it's because certain parts of our organization are over 50 percent and others particularly those where you have technology are significantly lower and we have to do the catch-up. 
We need more women in technology. We do need more, more women in technologies, the STEM field uh, as a whole. But, you know, of the companies that you interact with on a regular basis, like you said, you look at people at the entry level and then you look at, at the leadership level as well. The beginning of the race, it's fairly crowded. There are a lot of people. But it's only as we move towards the end of the race, we do see a lot of women falling out. So what do you suggest that organizations should do? And what is it that you guys do to ensure that, you know, women don't fall out of that cycle? Well, we examined it. As you know, uh, we are a partnership. And so the top of the heap is actually partnership. And we have a target that 25% of our partners should be women. But we want to do it in a very transparent way. Uh, there are no special favors here. It's purely on merit. Part of the issue was that as an older organization, we didn't have many women earlier on in the workforce. And now as we are growing that, we said, firstly, shorten the number of years to partnership. So say if it was 12 years to partnership, we made it nine then increase the number of women you have, then look at which are the levels where you are having slowdowns. Say for us, it's at a deputy manager level. When you start getting into the crisis that you get into, you know, you, you, you get married, you're feeling the pressures of work, uh, home, uh, work life balance, etc. That's when you have interventions to say, how can this stay on? The trick is to get, the secret is to get people to actually be in your organization for over five years and then develop them. You have sponsorship at different levels to sponsor them, give them support, not in a way to get them to the next level because you've given them the support, but to get themselves to realize what they need to do to get to the next level. All right, I get that point. And a final quick one, a personal question at home, who rules the roost? Is there any question about that? <laughs> I have two daughters and a loving wife. Perfect. Uh, that makes sense. Ritu, with that, it's back to you. Well, thanks, Manglam. I have Manish with me here, who is from Godrich Capital. Somebody as a male in the field of finance. How many females are there in leadership position in your organization to begin with? Ashi, firstly, uh, thanks for having me here. Pleasure to be here. And, uh, you know, like you said, as, you know, uh, as a male speaker on the panel, it's quite, quite a privilege to be invited. Um, so from our perspective, actually, we're blessed. 50% uh, of our leadership team is women. Um, more than a third of our um, CXO population, CXO minus one, are women. So we've got like a great bunch of senior women. And, you know, as I was having a word with Shireen earlier, it's not just stereotypical roles. You know, so for example, our chief risk officer is a woman, um, our chief technology officer is a woman, our chief infrastructure uh, officer is a, a woman, and like, all super talented and, like I said, very lucky for us uh, to have them with us. Well, we're glad to hear that, certainly. And women do make for better, better uh, leaders. There are surveys that show that women CEO-helped companies are usually more profitable return, uh, better stock returns for uh, investors over a longer period of time. Uh, what is the sort of strategy that you at Godrich Corp uh, Capital are employing to ensure that there is diversity in the workforce? Yes, yeah, so Ritu, it's a uh, you know, great question. And if I can step back for just a second from our perspective, both diversity and inclusion go much beyond just gender, right? Yeah. There's um, just backgrounds, diversity in um, gender is one, religious, uh, you know, uh, religion is another, sexual orientation is another. Uh, you know, we're very, very happy with the first cohort of folks who are, uh, you know, people with disability. So for us, people who come from different backgrounds bring so much to the table. Um, it starts with leadership, but then it goes all the way across the company. What we're seeing right now is just when the company is a melting pot, when the orgs are melting pot and you're open to ideas and you just, um, it's people who bring in different perspectives that just makes for a far, far better environment. And that shows up in so many things, right? Um, so for instance, we really, really value innovation. And it's hard to innovate if everybody's got the same background, looks the same, talks the same. So, so far, so good. Um, once you get the, the pillar set, once you get you know, the, first, the first set of senior folks, they also become sort of lighthouses, right? They attract, similarly, they attract people who think, okay, um, these guys don't all look the same. There's just, uh, it's a place I could come and thrive. And that then feeds on itself. And we've, like I said, we've been both lucky and you know, beneficiaries of seeing a diverse talent pool play out very well for us. But have you ever seen biases play out in the boardroom? What are some of the most bizarre things you've heard? I, I think we've got, you know, um, I think biases which are 
um, upfront and out there are fewer and fewer. And I'll tell you. Um, so I think a lot of biases which are the hardest to beat are the ones that are innate and which are things you have to work on. When are you guilty of them? Bias. Yes, I am. I'll give, let's give you an example, right? Um, financial services has been guilty of being this whole old boys club, right? So for instance, something as simple as every celebration doesn't have to be a drink after dinner. It doesn't work for everybody, right? It's, you can as well uh, lunch at, you know, while you're at the office and still end the day on time is still a celebration. Uh, now, these are unconscious biases. You think you're doing the, you know, you think you're all uh, one bunch and we're all guilty of it, myself included. So you've got to work at it. Uh, and I think those are the bigger challenges. I think we've, you know, we've come a long way, not just us as a company, but, you know, and us as a group. But I think Corporate India has come a long way, a long way to go for sure. But we've come a long way on the conscious biases, the unconscious ones we've got to get better at. Well, we're certainly glad to hear it. Uh, on that note, Manglam, I'm going to toss it back to you. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, we're talking women. Let's talk about the markets as well. Now we do have with us Tahir Bacha. Tahir, uh, on a regular basis, we ask you, you know, your view on the markets, where it's going, etc. This time, let me put you in a bit of a spot. Let me just uh, ask you, how many of your portfolio companies have women as leaders? Well, I think uh, top of the mind, I would think about five companies, four or five companies clearly happen to be where we are seeing leadership uh, at the top uh, being uh, represented by women. So I think, and I think we've done well with some of those companies, so no regrets. <laughs> no regrets indeed. But you know, and that's better than what is there in the Nifty itself, because of the 50 companies on the Nifty, there are just two of them which are uh, led by women. There's HDFC Life, there's Vibha Padalkar there, and there is Apollo Hospital. So that's another company which is led by women. So in that regard, your portfolio having five uh, companies yeah, led by women. There are a couple of companies in the mid and small cap space also, which are actually uh, fallen through that bracket. So I think, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, for example, Nika, which has come in recently. So. <laughs> That's one of our portfolio ownership as well. So, yeah, I mean, I think collectively, I would, top of the mind, I would say about four or five companies. And if there is one thing, noticeable difference, if you have any in terms of research that you've seen with uh, difference between companies which are led by women and led by men? Uh, well, nothing that I can uh, point out, but uh, clearly, I think, uh, you know, they, they are still the younger lot and uh, you know, they've, they've, they are relatively more, uh, uh, I think, um, uh, they have a lot on them in terms of uh, what they want to do. So I think, uh, uh, yeah, that enthusiasm is uh, somewhat different in some of these companies compared to uh, those which have been traditionally met by, uh, led by men. All right, wonderful. Thai. We'll let you go on that. Uh, uh, but we, prom uh, we, we ask you to leave with a promise that you will have to tell us market levels and all of that the next time you join us. <laughs> Back to you, Ritu. Well, I have with me Akansha uh, from Love Local. Akansha, uh, women in finance are a bit of a rare commodity. What are you as a woman leader doing to ensure that there's more diversity in your uh, you know, own workforce in your company? Uh, so I actually think just women lead differently. So instead of having to do proactive inclusion efforts at our leadership level, we are actually, I think right now, over 50% women. Mm -hmm. And as an organization, we are nearly a 50-50 split. So I think when you have women in senior positions, they naturally create honestly a more equal and fair playing field. Okay. Um, what is the one advice you'd give to younger women who are joining the workforce now and do they have it easier than you had when you started? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I would say that I really hope it is easier. I walk on the road of women who've paved the way before me and I hope we're doing our small part to pave the way for the next generation. So I do hope that it's easier. Uh, though India's data in terms of labor force participation wouldn't indicate that. Um, in terms of advice I would give, um, I think you have to persevere. I think the one single statement I would say is never give up and realize that you're capable of achieving everything you dream of. Uh, what is the single most ridiculous bias you've come across for women uh, in leadership positions? That you need to have a man by your side. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. Um, and, Start. and slowly he will settle down and say, no, no, you guys are doing a great job. I think you can make few other advanced dairy machineries in India also. And he used to constantly encourage us to do it. He has always recognized Larson Dubrow as a major dairy supplier to NDDB and help them indigenize the whole program. We used to import the milk powder and we used to liquefy that. From that to become a major power in manufacturing of milk production is the legacy one can 
always remember of Dr. Kurian contribution to this nation. Presented by HSBC. Knowledge Partner, Deloitte. Industry Partner, Fiki. Associate Partner, Reliance Industries Limited. you I'm Shruti Mishra and I welcome you all to the big launch of HSPC presents CNBC TV 18's Future Female Forward, the Women's Collective. Knowledge partner Deloitte, industry partner Fiki and associate partner Reliance Industries Limited. These three words, future female forward, are actually intertwined within each other. Women are the future, they have been spearheading from the front and will continue to drive us forward to a glorious tomorrow. Today we bring you a pioneering initiative to support women as she makes her mark on the world. It's a part of a continuous initiative that CNBC TV 18 has been a part of to put the spotlight on this very pertinent subject of gender equality and economic growth opportunity at the workplace. With the goal to bridge this gap and initiate a dialogue as a purpose-driven brand and the leader in English business news, CNBC TV18 has taken it upon itself to be a trusted partner and an ally. So let's commence this evening by inviting on stage flow artist Esh Nakuti, who shot to fame hula hooping to A.R. Rahman's Genda Pool in sari and sneakers. Please put your hands together for Eshna, who will groove to a masterpiece thoughtfully curated by award-winning singer Sonam Kalra. Eshna, over to you. gentlemen, a huge round of applause for Reshna Kutti and also this is our national anthem, this is our national anthem for our series Future Forward. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a huge round of applause once again and also please do tweet about the evening using the hashtag Future is Hers. I would now like to welcome on stage CNBC TV 18's managing editor Shireen Bhan to talk about her passion project which has brought all of us together this evening. Shireen, over to you. Good evening ladies and gentlemen and what an absolute pleasure it is to welcome you all here this evening to celebrate the launch of what is a very personal passion project as Shruti mentioned but first of all a big round of applause to Eshna and to Sonam Kalra for putting together that fabulous anthem so please tweet 
uh, talking about the anthem that we've just released uh, today. Uh, and this is going to be part of the campaign as it unfolds. Uh, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I don't want to throw statistics your way because study after study highlights the outperformance of countries and corporations that prioritize gender. Uh, and yet, we're still so far behind in bridging the gap. And this uncomfortable reality was the starting point of our journey to mainstream the conversation around the need for inclusion, diversity, and parity in our society, in our homes, and in our workspaces. It's a journey that we started at CNBC TV 18 more than a decade ago. As journalists, we have attempted to ask crucial questions. Why are we seeing a decline of women's participation in the workforce? Why are women opting out of the workforce after, in fact, making it in? Why do we see so few women in leadership roles? We've tried to focus on the how. How do we change this worrying trend? How do we get key stakeholders to acknowledge this as a problem and recognize the potential upside of fixing it? And finally, we've made a concerted attempt to address the what. What is being done by policymakers in India and globally to bridge the gap? What are corporations doing? And what can civil society and the social sector, the media, and us as citizens do to create an equal opportunity culture? Today, we take a crucial next step in amplifying our efforts with the launch of this very special campaign, Future Female Forward. This is our effort of creating a collective of stakeholders, of putting together a playbook of best practices, of shared experiences to accelerate change. We want to work towards creating an inclusive, diverse workforce. It is not just the right thing to do, ladies and gentlemen, it is the smart thing to do. It is the fair thing to do. It is the humane thing to do. And as leaders, we must stand up for a much more equal future. It is our responsibility. We have to do more and we have to do better. This is not going to be an easy journey, but we must find co-travelers who are allies and partners. And Hitendra Dave at HSBC turned out to be a co-traveler, quite literally, because we were on a flight together. And Hitendra asked me uh, what I was working on and I told him that I was working on this project and the next minute he said sign HSBC up for it we're on board with that so thank you very very much Itendra for unequal vocally supporting us. It's the same for our industry partner, Fiki, when we presented the idea to them, they came on board. And of course, Deloitte, our knowledge partner, when we spoke with Deloitte, they were on board. So thank you very much for being allies and partners in this effort, for walking this path with us. To all the men and to all the men and women in this room, we have the privilege of having been able to make our choices. Let our choices today be driven by hope and not by fear. Let's work towards a society where people are not prisoners of their circumstances, but active participants in shaping their future. So thank you once again, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us here this evening. I hope you have a fabulous time. We have some fabulous conversations lined up for you. And as I said, this is supposed to be an effort to put together a playbook of best practices. I hope we can do that at the end of this fabulous campaign. I'd now like to request Hitendra to join Join me on stage. Uh, HSBC India is our partner in this pioneering initiative to come up and unveil the specially curated artwork that distinctly embeds the essence of future female forward. Hitendra, thanks very much. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, a huge round of applause, please. by Mumbai-based artist Hari Bhavnathesan. He specializes in recycling all kinds of junk from organic to inorganic, even metal, wood, plastic, e-waste, and even bird feathers. He sees life in stillness and a beginning in every end. Whenever he sees scrap materials, he believes it's a soul waiting to come to life. I have to thank Hari Babu for the beautiful creation. Thank you Sonam Kalra and Ishna Kutti for penning and performing this beautiful musical piece. This is my time. Thank you Shireen Bhan and Hitendra Dave for doing the honors. There could not have been a better way, ladies and gentlemen, to kickstart this evening. But before we get on with the evening, let's take a look at what lies beyond the glass ceiling.
She wants to live a life without fear. She wants the opportunity to set the highest standards and benchmarks. She wants to be a ceiling breaker, a go-getter and a change maker. She wants to be the leader of today and tomorrow. CNBC TV 18 takes another very important step to ensure that gender parity becomes an undeniable reality. Where equitable gains, equal participation, infinite growth become the rule, not the exception of the game. Making the future truly forward. HSBC presents CNBC TV 18 Future Female Forward, the Women's Collective. Presented by HSBC. Knowledge partner, Deloitte. Industry partner, Fricky. Associate partner, Reliance Industries Limited. Now taking the evening forward, it gives me immense pleasure to start our first session themed Leaders Forum Playing for Parity, a special conversation addressing the evolving role of women, particularly in the workplace and economy, and the ecosystem facilitating this progress. The following leaders belonging to India's top enterprises are front-runners, proactively pay playing for parity not just in their own businesses, but inspiring young enterprises to follow suit. Along with them, we also have with us an industry leader who is mainstreaming the gender parity discussion and an ambassador who has been championing the cause of gender equality in her country, India, and the world. To lead the session, I would first like to call back on stage Shireen Bhan. She's the moderator for the session. Please welcome our panelists, Dr. Anish Shah, Managing Director and CEO of Mahindra Group, Hitendra Dave, CEO of HSBC India, Manisha, Managing Director and CEO Godrej Capital, and Venkatram, CEO Deloitte India, Prabhat Narsimham, CEO Colgate Palmolive India Limited, Her Excellency Ritwa Koku Ronde, Ambassador of Finland to India, and Dr. Sangeeta Reddy, Joint MD, Apollo Hospitals Group. Ladies and gentlemen, a huge round of applause for our panelists this evening. It is not very often that you see this on stage, ladies and gentlemen. I have done panel discussion after panel discussion for the last 22 years, and invariably, it's a room full of suits, and I'm the only woman there. So this really, really, really is fabulous to see. Equal representation pretty much here on stage, and what a perfect start to this fabulous evening. Uh, without further ado, you know, I, I want to start with you, Ambassador, because I don't know how many people here know. We all know about the fact that Finland uh, has a great track record when we talk about gender parity, when we talk about inclusivity. But I don't know how many of you know that Finland was the first country in the world to allow women to vote and also give them eligibility to participate in the parliamentary process way back in 1906. And today, in 2022, I think almost 47% of your parliament is women. So, Ambassador, what's the story, what's the secret to ensuring that you have this kind of diversity, this kind of inclusivity? First of all, great pleasure and honor to be here. And indeed, it's very seldom that you have such a high participation of male uh, participants in a uh, discussion where gender equality uh, is discussed. So, congratulations. We, we didn't want only women talking to other women. We wanted the men to talk to women and the women to talk to men as well. So, what, uh, I, I don't think Finland has any secret, uh, actually. It's a hard work. When, when one thinks about 100, more than 100 years ago, 
We were an agrarian country, a lot of diversity, a lot of in parity and uh, all, all that kind of things. But when women were elected to the parliament, they were coming more these kind of social issues also. And they were able to change together, of course, men, the legislative framework in a way that it benefited both women and women in, uh, in education, in, uh, in working life, and also in a political participation. The other thing is, and indeed, we, we made that sort of legislation also. We have at the moment, and we have achieved a lot. We have a free, uh, free quality education, public education, free for all, mandatory nowadays until the age of 18. So it means that after the uh, primary, secondary school, one has to go to at least vocational training. So I would put emphasis here that edu education, free education, all kind of enables to do, for instance, free school lunches or parental leaves or child care, which is practically free also, practically free health care combined to that enabling environment uh, on, uh, on, uh, on uh, making, uh, making uh, economic grow. Mm. And actually, if you are looking statistically also that the last 50 years in the Nordic countries, we count that maybe 10 to 20 percent of our GDP growth is due to the fact that, the, uh, that uh, the, we have relatively high gender equality. So we never have been able to, and we couldn't really uh, enable women to stay at home only, although of course homework is also homework, but the sort of active participations of everybody to build the society. And we have had hard times, uh, hard times, Second World War, really hard times mm. after that as well. So it hasn't been really an easy path, but it is a path to become a, one of the leading countries when it comes to innovations, technologies, or when it comes to the social uh, equality also in the society. And that is, I think that is the success also, that everybody is participating and uh, having the possibility to participate. And this is, this is public, private, there are civil society organizations. And then I would put also combined of, of, uh, of, uh, of really uh, um, equality in the sense of respecting of human rights, mm -hmm. judiciary, democracy, and the participation in, uh, in, in that sense. Long answer to your question. No, no, that was, that was a very comprehensive answer to my question. And I think uh, what you said is absolutely right. It is not, there's no silver bullet. There is no magic wand. It's a hard, arduous journey that everyone must undertake. Uh, there are tough choices to be made. But because it is a national priority, in fact, it is one of the four national priorities that Finland has put in place that they've been able to achieve the kind of success that they have. Sangeeta Reddy, I, I want to come to you. And first of all, thank you very much for being here. You know, Sangeeta had a family celebration last night and uh, she wasn't sure if she was going to be able to join us here in person. I messaged her, I said, please come in person. And she's here, so thank you so much. I really, really appreciate that, Sangeeta. It means a lot to us. You know, Along with your sisters, you've been part of the family business. You've been running Apollo Hospital, Sangeeta, for as long as uh, you, know, you started your career. But what was the experience like when you led an industry chamber? How, how, how is that different from, uh, from your work experience so far? So, Shireen, first, it's a pleasure to be here. And I really want to thank you for putting the spotlight on this and this whole concept of future female forward is very powerful. What is the world looking for? What is our future? We're talking about equity. We're talking about, you know, a kinder, better world. We're talking about the environment. And I think all these are um, ideologies that women kind of naturally embody. So the world will be a better place when we look at equity. But jumping directly into your question, um, I want to say that uh, Fiki was a great experience. Two years ago, I uh, had, headed the chamber. I wasn't the first woman leading it. I was actually the third. third yeah. So Fiki does have a culture, whereas my sister who headed CII was actually CII's first female president. So uh, that was interesting. But um, I really want to say that I believe that educated, um, 
Men and women who are exposed and who are confident don't have that many problems about gender equality. And therefore, at FIGHI, it was a lot of fun. Of course, it was a difficult year because it was also the COVID year. So we did more Zoom calls than actual meetings. But the main point I want to make in just one line is that if we have uh, the exposure, the education, the open-mindedness and the mindset, then it's about leadership. It's not about female leadership. Yeah. And that's really where we need to go and where I think India is headed. I absolutely agree with you. And Anisha, I want you to pick up on what we just heard there from Sangeeta. You know, the idea behind putting this event together and getting each one of you to speak is to understand what what organizations are actually doing to encourage bringing more women into the workforce, what you're actually doing to retain women uh, and, uh, and enable them to lead organizations as well. I want to understand from the Mahindra experience, uh, you know, traditionally when you think of manufacturing, you think of the assembly line, you don't think of women being on the assembly line, but that's changing. It's changed at Mahindra, it's changed in a lot of other Indian uh, manufacturing companies, auto companies specifically. How did that happen and what are you now trying to do to to ensure that the momentum picks up pace further. Shiri, to start with, uh, this is a very important initiative because in India in particular, we see a lot less female participation in leadership. Uh, so at the shop floor, it has changed a lot and that goes from the practices in the company. But we haven't done as good a job at the leadership level. Mm. That's something that we are driving very hard right now. Why do you think that's the case? I think that's the case that it just reflects the rest of industry. So typically when we search for new leaders, the answer from search firms is, well, there are no candidates for this. And that's something that we have to fight hard against. At the board level today, in all our major boards, 30 to 40 percent are women. At the corporate level, over the last couple of years, of 14 hires, nine are women at this very senior level. Uh, Mahindra Finance now, I'm proud to say that, uh, has 40 percent of the CEO's direct reports as women, uh, which just happened over the last few months. So that journey has started, but there's still a long way for us mm. to go. It's a long way to go, and I want to then address this issue of the cause as well as the result. Uh, you know, you said that when search firms are put out to look for women candidates, they come back and say that they're not enough women. And that might genuinely be an issue as well because you see a large attrition happen as far as the mid-level is concerned in that life cycle of maternity, etc. You actually see women dropping out. That's one aspect. The other aspect of, you know, the representation of women on boards, etc., through the Companies Act, making it mandatory to have at least one woman director on the board, uh, that has increase the numbers but is reservation the answer you know a very a, a woman leader in a very high position of power speaking to me a few days ago she said i don't know if i want reservation for women because then i always feel like the men are looking at me saying you got here because of reservation you didn't get here because of merit is that then the answer reservation is clearly not the answer right? i've gone through this journey in my previous organization at g capital where we went from 5% women of my direct reports to literally 44% over five years. And the most important part was it has to be based on meritocracy. No one in the organization should feel that someone is there because there was a spot reserved. And that is an extremely essential part of the culture in the organization. Uh, and even as I talked about search firms, the minute we started pushing back on them, the firms we work with now know that they cannot give us a slate without having participation from women candidates who are uh, by merit the right people for that role. So it's just a matter of pushing hard. It's easy to say, okay, here's a pool available, let's just pick from there. But you've got to go deeper to the next level. You know, speaking of the next level, yeah, Sangeeta, you wanted to make a point. Yeah. I just wanted to make a quick point. And, um, you know, women or environments where there hasn't been uh, deprivation or negativity, you don't need reservation. Yeah. But if we want to catch up fast, we need a little bit of a boost. And whichever way you bring that boost, you look at the number of female directors in India. The independent director number grew only after it became regulated. So is that necessarily bad? Are, we, are people going to sit there and say you got here because uh, there was reservation? Probably in the beginning. Mm. But this is a step towards a greater good. 
So, you know, I do believe there's some case for intelligent reservation. Yeah, yeah. And the fact of the matter is that we have seen the numbers go up. In fact, they're still not as high as we need them to be, but we have seen the numbers go up. Prabhu, speaking about the next level, and in your experience of being in the FMCG space and now at Colgate, uh, you know, are there specific interventions that you're making to ensure that you can keep attrition low, especially at the mid-management level? So firstly, Shireen, thank you very much for having me here. I, I think you said it's the you know, future female forward, uh, right thing to do, smart thing to do. I could not agree more. Uh, I think um, from middle management level, once women have perhaps gone through the phase of maternity, they're thinking about coming back to work, there are certainly two or three things that I think companies can do to help them. One, of course, is to provide mentorship. Uh, the idea of people you can look up to, whether they be men or women, who can help guide you and help you to chart a career path that works for you, because not everything works for everyone would be, I think, the first one. The second one is, I think we should really encourage women to have networks. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of women feel that networking is not something that either that they're good at or that they should be doing. Uh, and the networks can be truly helpful, particularly in moments where you're feeling, is this the right thing for me to do or should I be stepping back and you know doing something else so these two for me are perhaps the the biggest two things that I think organizations could really help a, a, a women's club to the boys club is that really the answer no actually I don't mean networks of women I mean yeah. just networks yeah, I agree. Uh, gender neutral I, networks I, I, I agree and I, and I keep saying this I said you know you don't want to replace one club with another because clubs are exclusionary what you actually want is a collective and which is why we've called this the future female collective because we want it to be a collective, not just of women, but a collective of men and women to take the conversation forward. Hitendra Dave, the financial space, the financial services space has actually done better, both in terms of representation of women in different roles and functions, as well as in leadership positions. I know that this is something that you're championing personally at HSBC and HSBC is championing globally as well. What have been the challenges of being able to uh, pick up pace on the goal that you've set for yourself by 2025? Yeah, hi, Shireen. So I think um, one is you mentioned, right, that uh, you can do everything you want. You go to the campus. That tends to be the, the largest uh, number of hiring uh, spots for us, and, and it does become extremely competitive there, right? So from just the sheer number of women employees who, or potential employees who are available, either middle management, senior management, or entry level, the numbers are skewed. So I think when you see engineering colleges hopefully five years from now, ten years from now, or MBA institutes five years from now, ten years from now, where there's a natural balance. I think you use the word parity and inclusiveness and, and you know, diversity. Mm -hmm. So when you get it naturally, and I think uh, conversations such as this will clearly then trigger more and more employers, more and more corporates, more and more boards, more and more managements. So that's, I think, one part, that the challenge is the sheer availability. I think um, the other thing, I do want to change the narrative a little bit, and that's why I think, you know, why at least I can speak for the firm that, that I represent, that I think there is almost a recognition and an acceptance that you are not doing anybody any favors. Yeah. Okay, so you are not doing any women any favor. It's, it's not a tick-the-box exercise. There is clear data, there is clear evidence that companies that have diversified pools of talent in this instance, we are talking about gender diversity, but could be somebody from a tribal area, somebody from a non-urban area. You do tend to get much better quality inputs into your decisions. So I think that's the other thing. So at least from an HSBC perspective, it's about wanting to make sure that we do a better job. And if we think we'll do a better job by having more women in our executive management teams, in our, in our mid-management teams, that's part of that. So, I, you know, you spoke about reservation. I, I actually think it's it's the right thing to do if you want to do a good job. But overall, I think uh, I think financial sector has had great leaders. We have a ex deputy governor sitting amongst us. I yes. mean, and we were just talking to her. She was a deputy governor along with another deputy governor who was a woman. Absolutely. When I think this subject was not even live, right? And yes. we have had women leaders in some of the private sector banks, and the, and those banks were just known for all. So I think there are lots of role models. You are a role model, if I may say so, for a lot of people. So. So I think it's, we need these role models, we need organizations to realize that they're not doing any, anybody any favors, but most importantly, you need women to realize that they can do a great job at home as well as in the office, and the organizations now are more than willing to listen and do what it takes. At least we think we are trying to do that. 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Shamla Gopina, the former Deputy Governor of the Reserve Bank of India, please give her a big round of applause. Really path-breaking women leaders who are here with us this evening as well. Manish, let me address this issue that we just heard there from Hitendra. In terms of uh, organizations being more listening, being more empathetic, and actually trying to change the culture, uh, change policies to ensure that you bring in more women and you retain more women and you create a culture of meritocracy. I know you've made this a C-suite priority for you, and there's already been a fair amount of work that's gone in there. What's worked? What hasn't? Sure. Just before, like you said, Shireen, it, uh, it isn't every day that you get to be on a panel like this. I'm equal parts proud and nervous to be here. So for starters, I think it first starts from absolutely from the top, right? It wasn't until I joined Godrej over the, uh, three and a half years ago that the appreciation came through that a diversity goes much, much beyond gender, it goes to religion, sexual orientation, just parts of the country you're from. Um, and for you to accept that if you're going to stand out for innovation, it's never going to come from a bunch of folks who all look and talk and sound the same. So like you said, right, it's not just the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. And I think, again, like you said, as much as we love the idea of a silver bullet, I have, you know, we've yet to find one. And if we could break it up into three parts in how we are trying to address it, and we had the opportunity at Gothic Capital because we were starting from scratch. So we had sort of the help from the group. We had people to learn from and role model from. For example, in the FMCG business, Gothic Consumer has 40% of the board are women. Long before it became a mandate, you know, the rest of the country moved from, I think, five or six to three times that is already at 40. So there was a high benchmark already set. But as we got to doing it, we figured that it's really, it's hard work. So in our case, you know, just th three things that we've uh, looked at working with. First, you need representation and real representation. One of the risks that we all run in corporate India is we can tick the boxes, we can meet the numbers. Representation for us means seat at the table. So for us, in my management team, 50% are women. So it's like right down the middle, half and half. It starts there, but doesn't stop there. It's got to go to see XO minus one. Again, their numbers are, are similar. But again, you know, like uh, we spoke earlier, as getting, you know, getting the leadership team through the door is the start. Once there, once the, you know, once leadership is in, um, it's been a struggle, and it's been again a lot of hard work. Part of our teams here, you've got a bright, you know. Uh, expand the top of the funnel. Mm -hmm. If I'm a middle level, you know, hiring manager, I've got five people to hire and I've got 10 resumes to hire them from. And if you only saw, you know, if nine of the 10 are men and then you expect me to meet 40, 50 percent, how am I going to manage that? And there are ways to do that, right? Careers 2.0, you've got to look harder. So one, part one, representation and seat at the table. Part two is just ease of doing business. So in financial services, so many of our policies are, you know, old boys club led. For example, we've just got crazy end of month, end of quarter, late nights. And so often when you get the policies right for women, it's the right thing to do for the company. For instance, it's just par for the course to be sitting up through midnight, you know, end, uh, end of quarters, uh, burning the midnight oil, getting it done. Level one, you solve for saying, just do the right thing, get the cab going, trusted, you know, late night providers, etc. But level two is saying, hang on a second, yeah. if we're new age, aren't we going to get better? Should, you know, shouldn't everybody just go home at a decent hour? Yeah. Yeah. And last not least, actually, is um, how are you facilitating growth? So, you know, folks spoke about coaching and networks internally, so I won't talk any more about that, but there are a few programs there. But one example I'd love to give is very, very often women growing in organizations, uh, mobility has been a problem. It's perfectly normal for the spouse, the wife, to follow the husband if he's moving up, but doesn't always work the other way around. So why must you always have to move to head office if you're going to take the promotion or let it go? Mm. The country is pretty much an equal market. Those of us who are in retail businesses, every leader doesn't have to sit in the same building. So if you, you know, you're based elsewhere, and you know, we've, we've loved the fact that we've been able to promote folks in saying you will you know, you, you run the larger job, yeah. travel as you need to, as all of us do, but you don't need to move.
No, so I think a few of these things. You, you, you know, that's an important point that you make, and I want to segue that uh, to, to you, Mr. Venkatram, because Deloitte does a study uh, on what really impacts women in the workforce. And, and this is, you know, this is a real statistic. I think it's what, 51% women feel that they have mental health related issues because of uh, just dealing with the pressures that come with work and dealing with stuff at home as well. And that's a reality and that's an undeniable reality. Uh, I, I want you to take us through uh, you know, what the data is telling us about what's constraining women, what's holding back women in the workforce. Thank you. I think that first, I must really genuinely thank you because in Deloitte we have a rule of 40, 40, 20, that 40% 40 men, 40% women. So if women, you can hold up the mic. And 20% yeah. uh, for the underprivileged. Uh, today, though, I'm privileged to be here with you. If I count myself in the underprivileged, we have the right ratio of representation <laughs> here. Well, I, I, I mean, it's... I mean, this is a vexing problem, but it's also the greatest, I, I think, the opportunity of our times. Mm. If, and let me start at a macro level to say, if I look at India, because we're all here, we're all building businesses here, 400 million millennials in this country, 50% minimum women, that's 200 million millennials. Even if you say we get 50% of that in the workforce, and that's 100 million, it's a staggering number. I'm pretty sure that most of us in this room have an average age which is below 30 as well. I mean, I for one in our organization employ 8,000 women, the vast majority are about 27 to 28 years old. And this is the excitement. And we talked about whether it's the right thing to do. We believe that it's the right business thing to do. Yeah. But when we do our surveys, and these are global surveys, this is not an India survey. This is a survey, uh, am I okay or am I? Yeah, 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 no. fine. Uh, this is a survey which we did in 30 countries across. And I think it's certainly also due to the pandemic that there was a lot of stress in the system. I also do believe that one of the reasons why this happens, if I look at causal factors, is because when we look at how we deal with women of, in the workforce, we sometimes forget that they do a hell of a lot of work outside of their work. And during the pandemic, that was particularly, you know, very, very stressful with the fact that your children were at home, uh, you know, you have a lot of families where people thought it's a woman's job to take care of what happens to the child at home. And therefore, when you look at stress, we look at stress in the workplace to say solve it by not just trying to solve what happens at work. Work-life balance is not just about what happens at work. It's what happens in life. So you've got to look at life as a whole, look at it more holistically. But the, the real finding we got from the survey is the fact that if you have those evolved organizations who know how to respect the fact that you have to treat your entire workforce, it's not just women, because we're talking about equality, here. men and women better. If you have a happier workplace, you get far better results. And of course, in this survey, we surveyed the women. And women who were surveyed who were in these happier organizations said that they were willing to stay with the same organization for more than five years. In our services industry, five years is like a bonus, right? because you're spending so much time training people, they build the relationships. If you keep them for five years, you've virtually got them for life. Yeah, I, I agree that if you make it conducive for women to stay on, uh, they will. But, you know, I want to address that issue, and I'll get each one of you to talk about that. Sangeeta, let me start by asking you to actually have policies uh, where I, I think we're still struggling with the mindset that a maternity benefit. It's not a benefit. It is a right that the woman has because she is actually looking after uh, and child care is the primary responsibility, and especially uh, in patriarchal cultures like ours. So to get the to get corporations to change the mindset of seeing these as benefits or incentives to women and also to look at things from a much more gender neutral way. So why not look at parental leave and make that an option and make that accessible to people. I know Finland is doing that. What about the opportunity as a business opportunity for child care, for geriatric care? Why are we not thinking actively about these things. I mean, we, we, we are one of the world's best destinations when it comes to uh, health care. Why aren't we actively thinking about affordable child care, affordable geriatric care, which otherwise becomes a disproportionate burden on women? 
So, Shireen, with this question, you've really opened up a series of, uh, you know, the next dimension. Starting first with the policy, I, I want to take a minute to say that uh, during this time at FICI, we started what was called the greater 50 percent. Because we said that while in India the population of women is under 49, their impact is actually the greater 50 percent. Because their impact is seen in multiple dimensions which are very often not measured. And one of those unmeasured dimensions is the care economy, which is a whole separate subject. Can we quantify it? Can we put a tag on it? What will the impact be if we could tag the care economy? Our GDP would almost go up by 40 to 70 percent, depending on how you look at it. So that's one whole dimension. But coming back to the important thing of two, two important things that you raised, one is policy and the other is mindset. So in policy, we actually made a framework called the female friendly organization, which was a simple checklist. You know, from things like, do you have toilets? What do you do in terms of leave policy? Do you have paternity leave? Uh, and therefore the woman, it's not just about being able to stay at home and protect her income. It's also what happens to her place in the career ladder. Because if she's taking six months or one year off, has she lost her promotion opportunities? So we need to start thinking equal in many ways. And with that and a policy framework, I really want to jump to the whole idea of mindset. Because many of these are not just about a policy framework, it's about execution and it's about mindset. And I'm going to give you a very simple example. Uh, many medical colleges today have almost 70% women. This is interesting. I mean, Apollo has, our, our female workforce is over 50%, our board is more than 55%, uh, but our medical college has 80% women, yeah. uh, but that's a different story. The important point I'm trying to make is that when a woman in a home is a doctor, somehow the mother-in-law, the husband, everybody is very understanding about their need to go and serve a patient in the middle of the night. Yeah. Uh, that they're taking calls, that they're staying late. This ability to respect the woman's career, and, and I'm really happy they're doing it for women doctors, but I think this ability to extend this framework yeah. to more than the medical profession will be one step towards recognition of women's contribution in the workforce at large. Absolutely. So we need to focus on that. And that is, again, you know, coming from your silver bullet point, this may not happen, you know, yeah. in the next five years or in the next decade. But we must start asking the questions, what are we doing in terms of framing? How are we bringing up our young men? Yeah. Are yeah. they taking an equal role in the house? And, you know, uh, just this thing, I recently had a grandchild. And my daughter-in-law, very sweetly, I saw my grandson playing with his cousin's doll. And I asked her, can I buy him a doll? And she said, of course, I have no stereotypes for boys. And I loved it. Exactly. So 30-year-old women are saying we have no stereotypes for our sons. So I feel very strongly that in the next 10, 20 years, yeah. India is going to be a very different place. Yes, yes, Prabha, please. I just wanted to actually add on the policy point because you make a really great point. And when we make female first policies, they don't necessarily need to be targeted to women. Because if you start saying parental leave, then the responsibility is a shared responsibility. If it's maternity leave, then it is the mom's responsibility. And I think corporations can go a long way with their policies to modify mindset as well. Absolutely. Anish, I want to ask you, what's the roadmap? What are the targets that you're setting? What is the action agenda that you're putting together at M&M? I go back to what Sangeeta said. The primary word here is mindset. Because if you were to define success, success is not having conversations like this. Because that's really equality. And that's possible. I would tell you, growing up and, and through my early career, I never felt this divide. Right? That probably stems from my mother who was in the second batch at IIM Ahmedabad, one of two women, and an entrepreneur in the late 60s. Uh, my wife, who's one of the leaders in education today. And I was in organizations mainly in the US where my first five bosses were women. Right? So, coming back to India is when I really felt it, yeah. that this is different now. But that comes back to mindset and how can we create the organization culture where it is viewed as equal, everything. Policies, how we relate to each other, seat at the table at all levels, 
that's when we will have success. That's when we'll have success. Hitendra, what's the, what's the five priority areas for you? No, no, I, you know, I think, I think we mentioned it earlier that A, it's the right thing to do for your customers, for your staff, for your management team. So, you know, what is the right thing to do, you always do. So if, you know, advertising at a particular spot, let's say in her industry, is the right thing to do, you do it. So I think we all, and this is all men in the organization, definitely the senior women in the organization, need to be re-emphasizing again and again. This is, if you want a long, successful business, you will not be able to do so unless you have diversity of inputs. And, and you know, clearly we, science tells you or data tells you that you get that. I think the other thing, you know, and, and the unconscious biases will have to go away. So one of the very senior leaders in, in, our, in my organization once told me that, you know what is happening? For the same, let's say, a very aspirational role, if it's there, yeah. you, will take, you will take a bet on the men or the male candidate much more easily, but for the women, she has to pass much higher level yeah. of historical performance. Yeah. And that is a, that, and see, it is something I never thought of till it was told to me that, yes, you know, he's done something, you know, he, he's a great guy, he's, he's gregarious, he'll get it done. And, you know, in her case, she has to show that she's got like top rating. And she won't talk about it, by yeah. the way. She will not talk about it. <laughs> yeah. So it is changing. It is, ch at least in our organization, it is changing. They, 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 you are, there is no shyness in the organization, which is great, right? The third thing I think is, you, I mean, and, and, and you know, it was mentioned earlier, but you do need a proper mentoring, coaching, yeah. networking. It doesn't seem to come naturally for whatever reason. Um, but it will come naturally if there is a generation, two generations, yeah. three generations yeah. where whichever way you, you want to call it, the boys club, the girls yeah, club yeah, or whatever, yeah. but, but it is seen to be the natural way and that need not be just all women, but just Absolutely. a group of people who can go out. I also think you need specific programs. See, all talk will end up with nothing if we don't, now you want to call it reservation, that's, yeah. that's, but just somewhere where you're telling the women out there, and I want to use this broadcast to tell all the women out there, all the women in this room, that we, for example, have a program called Power to Her. It's a spectacularly successful program. Any woman who's taken a career break, for whatever reason, mm. can come back one year to 25 years later, mm. right? Any time you want to come back, you want to taste the workplace once again because it's been a long time, come back for six months or one year, that gives you on-the-job experience and we make every effort thereafter to make sure that that converts into a proper job. And last, like I said, I, I think in any organization, the senior leadership will have to take sponsor, will have to really yeah. drive this thinking, we'll kill, kill any yeah. negativity and on that and, and, uh, and thereafter then it uh, happens. Well, and it is, it is going to be a generational shift, it's going to be a generational change. Manish. So, uh, I think one of the best, the, so if we look at a roadmap, what we'd love to get to is we, where we don't have to track these statistics anymore and it just flows. And one of the lines that very early on got me thinking was, you know, when I was told that there's a difference between being invited to the party and having fun at the party. <laughs> it's very easy. We can send out invitations 50-50, but did you have fun at the party? If you had fun at that party, then you've made it work. Um, and th so if, if we get it right, we wouldn't need to track this anymore. There's, we're a long way from there, yeah. but if we can get you know, to that point. And, you know, one other, and a couple of interesting experiments we're going to have to try to go above and beyond, right? Mm. Um, a lot is spoken about when you're having a kid. The easy part is the six months off. Mm. If you don't do it, there's a law yeah. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, you've yeah. come to accept it. Yeah. How are you going to make it easy for folks to work when they come back? You know, two points. Uh, you know, Hitendra spoke about the careers 2.0 or people coming back. Our, you know, uh, the person who heads recruitment for us, she's in the audience today. She came back after having taken a break and actually led recruitment for us that then it was obvious saying if I can do it, it makes it easier. And I think, I think experiments that if they work, so yeah. where I sit, I just downstairs is the crash. So every time I look out of my window, I see a crash. And the number of people, you know, who've come back in saying the hard part's not the six months. Yeah, it's it's when I've got to leave, you yeah. know, my toddler at home and come to work, yeah. then it's, you know, then each time I've sort of asked and saying, you know, the kid's got a fever, yeah. I'm at work. Yeah. Every time I'm asked the, is it worth it? Yeah. That's when it starts to break down. Yeah. And the fun part actually is, it's a lovely crash town, so it's a lovely daycare. And half the time, actually, there's, there's guys in the office who are going down to check on their kids. Yeah. 
and you know over there is moms and dads so if you if you facilitate some of yeah. these things make it easier for folks to come yeah. back you know you're not going away in the first place and absolutely you know like he was saying stickiness uh, is pretty much for life then ambassador your message uh, my message is actually that um, uh, there is no uh, really sustainable development without uh, taking all all persons on board and uh, really seriously on board and uh, give the chance to the boys and girls equal chances uh, to men and women the other one is uh, that this is really smart thing to do because the companies are making better profit if they have more diversity on the uh, boards that is proven fact there is a uh, higher economic prosperity when everybody is engaged in equal manner so it is uh, it is smart thing to do and then the third thing is that uh, there can be really uh, a, a good life work balance my country is really having that and that is no reason uh, that is really one of the reason why finland has been chosen fifth time in a year in a year as a most happiest country in the world <laughs> absolutely <laughs> So it, it, makes, yeah. it makes you happy also, yes. that you don't really always have to work. Yeah. And the fourth is really that it is a mindset. Yeah. I, I'm very proud, a mother of two children, two girls, who, uh, who have, uh, who have uh, uh, married or boyfriends who can cook, clean and take care of their children. Absolutely. Well. <laughs> and may, may their tribe prosper and increase as well. Mr. Venkatram. Uh, I think number one priority always for us is tone at the top the boss has to walk the talk you've got to call out when people don't do it you've got to take specific affirmative steps that people know that this is business and that it's good for business uh, the second is we cleansed all our policies seven years ago when we started the journey to say it should all be gender neutral mm. we don't want something for men and something for women and that therefore means that even to the point that you made that if you know, you want people to not sit late. Don't say women should not sit after 8 o'clock. Say nobody should sit after 8 yeah, o'clock. Yeah. Because the longer the men sit yeah. at promotion time, they say, you know, I worked harder. Yeah. So when you get them out of the office, get them all out of the office. I equally do it for drinks. I actually had a one-hour drinks rule. Because you find that women can't sit late, right? So you said, if you have an evening of cocktails, it's one hour. You want to stack five in front of you and do glug, 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 do it. <laughs> but we stop in one hour. And I found that these, you know, are very purposeful and they really yeah. work. The most important is sponsorship. Yes. We found that sponsorship are two tier for us. One is sponsorship for, you know, as they're in their careers, critical jobs for us, like say, manager to senior manager, senior manager to director, director to partner. But then when we really reviewed it, and I have Mohini Shea who leads DEI for us, a very interesting twist we gave to this is, we said, let's look at our senior women partners and sponsor them too. Yeah. Because we think that this is a once in a lifetime thing you've got to do. Mm. You've unlocked the chakras and they're going to flourish. Yeah. But you've got to go back and say, what's working, what's not working. Yeah. Yeah. And then you've got to go back and support them visibly. And Absolutely. every person in leadership has to do that. Well, three. Yeah, you know, and that's I the perfect, perfect note to end this conversation on. Uh, you know, I, I think we've heard some very meaningful, insightful ideas and, of course, actual experiences being shared here by the leaders. And I completely agree with you that it has to be thoughtful, it has to be purposeful, and it has to be a journey. It cannot be, uh, you know, checking the boxes. It has to be reviewed, assessed continuously, and it has to sort of uh, uh, stand the test of time. And just to end and, you know, I, I think we've been pretty mindful of this at CNBC TV 18 as well. And I'm very, very proud to say that we have zero attrition at the level of the mid-management where young mothers have taken off because of maternity. We want them back. We value them when they come back. And I think that's really the message that we need to send out to women who return back to the workforce. So many, many thanks to Hitendra Dave Prabha, Anish, Sangeeta, Manish, Ambassador, and Mr. Venkatra for joining us here to kick off uh, the first conversation at the Future Feed email forward. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause. Thank you very, very much for your time.
Thank you all the esteemed panelists and of course Shireen for that insightful conversation and the long way we still have to go to ensure gender parity even in terms of mental health and burnout as mentioned in Deloitte's Women at Work report. It's a holistic change that we need to bring out collectively. Let's explore a lot more journeys on the other side of the break. Stay tuned.